Good evening everybody and welcome to this MHPN webinar on treating a health professional with mental health issues. Uh, we've had over 4,700 registrations for this webinar and currently already have 1,000 people online. So welcome and um, it's obviously a topic that is really um, close to the hearts of everyone who's here tonight. Um, MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to the Elders, past, present and future, for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. My name is Mary Emmelaeus and I will be facilitating tonight's session. Um, I am by background a general practitioner, which I did for about 20 years if you include my registrar training, and um, a psychotherapist and I was a rural or regional practitioner for all of my career until a year ago when I moved to the Gold Coast. Uh, I'm also now a psychiatry trainee. I'm in the fourth year of my psychiatry training. Um, I would just like to say that some of the content of tonight's message is around health practitioners who might be struggling. And um, so we want to remind you that if any of the content causes you distress, please seek care if you require it, including you could see your GP or contact Beyond Blue um, or your local mental health provider. Now, your, the panellist bios were circulated before the webinar and you've all had a chance to see them, so we, we won't go through them in depth, but I would like to welcome each of them in turn. So I think, Roger, I'll start with you. So you're a, a GP in... Um, South Australia and you're um, the chair of the Doctors Health Network, is that correct? Could you just tell us a little bit about that role and perhaps one thing you've done that you do regularly for your own self-care? Thanks, uh, thanks Mary. Thank you Mary and uh, it's great to be here and welcome everybody. It's great to be part of this very special event. Yes, I run the, oh, my background is as a rural uh, GP, procedural GP in the Adelaide Hills and um, my interest in Dr. Self grew out of that, uh, seeing colleagues who were struggling with a whole lot of issues. So in 2010, we started the Dr. Self program here in South Australia, and we've since established one in the Northern Territory, uh, a service purely for medical students and doctors. And you know we see all the range of issues coming out of that. So I'm sure a lot of these uh, problems that doctors have are shared by health, health professionals across the country. Um, in terms of what I do to help myself, I, I play the guitar and piano on a muso, and um, my ambition is to have a top 10 record <laughs> at some stage. Everyone's got to have ambition. Uh, so it, in terms of having some interests of your own, critical in mental health of health professionals. So I hope that comes up later on in, in the discussion. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Roger. It's great to have you. And uh, Christina Seglaris is a clinical psychologist. And Christina, you're in South Australia as well, I believe. So could you tell us a little bit about your practice and also something about your own self-care? Thanks. Thanks, Mary. It's good to be here. Um, yes, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm based in private practice in Adelaide. Um, my uh, interest in health prof professionals originally stemmed from working with fellow psychologists. Um, and burnout with them and then has expanded um, over time to work with doctors and medical students and I work closely with um, Roger and the other GPs at the Doctors Health Service in SA. Um, I see a range of professionals, medical students, doctors, nurses, psychologists, paramedics. Um, so I think this webinar is really, really important for um, all health professionals and I hope we have some interesting information tonight. Uh, and in terms of my own health and well-being, I try really hard to set limits on uh, not working when not at work um, and also ensuring that there's time for catching up with friends, family and general relaxation and self-care. Thank you, Christina, and welcome. And I'd also like to welcome Dr Emma Adams, who's a psychiatrist in the ACT. So Emma, and I understand you have an interest in treating health professionals as well. Could you just tell a little bit about your practice and um, also one of your self-care activities? Thanks. Okay. Um, 
I've returned to private practice after um, a wonderful sabbatical having adventures around the world. Um, my practice is perinatal and infant, but I do see a lot of doctors as well in my practice. Um, to look after myself, I take off to the bush and connect with country whenever I can, and that's what keeps me well. And I also write. Fantastic. Thank you for um, being part of the panel tonight. And I should also say I am a bit of a muse as well, so I like playing the violin, although I would have to say fiddle in a kind of Irish session, which I can't access because of COVID and because I left Cairns. But um, my partner and I play a bit of Irish music from time to time. And I also am very fortunate to live near the beach, which you can see from my bio photo. And um, I, I get to walk home along the beach from work. So I'm very blessed, I think. Um, I would just like to go on to some ground rules um, and also just where to get technical support if anyone's having any problems. So just remember that um, we need to behave in the chat box as though we were in a live face-to-face um, -face activity. So just be respectful of other participants and the panellists. Um, you can talk to each other, the participants, in the chat box. Um, just try and keep your comments on the topic. Now if you have a technical issue, you need to go to the technical support FAQ tab and if you can't find the answer to your problem in there, you can call a Redback Help Desk and the number is on your screen now. It's very, very rare, but sometimes something can happen that affects the overall delivery of the webinar. And if that happens, you'll be alerted via an announcement. Um, and the other thing is that right at the end, um, there will be a feedback survey. And MHPN really value your feedback and it helps inform um, future webinars, so please remember to um, fill out the feedback survey when the webinar finishes. Uh, just in case you're not familiar with the platform, there's a few things, colourful little dots up the top. So you'll see the purple thought bubble open the chat box, um, the blue arrow to access resources. So um, the panellists and MHPN have provided some resources that are relevant to the topic you can find there. Um, refresh, so sometimes you'll, the frequently asked questions, technical support will advise you to refresh your um, platform. Um, there's the exit button and then the feedback survey is the yellow one. So we'll remind you again at the end about that. The way our format's going to work is that each uh, panellist is going to introduce um, their response to the case study, um, just a short uh, response from how they would address it from their discipline and then um, there'll be a Q&A between the, pan the um, panellists after that. So hopefully, and I'm absolutely confident, it's going to be a really engaging conversation. The learning outcomes for tonight, um, we're going to hopefully, well definitely, you're going to end up with some tips and strategies for providing care to a health professional who's seeking care for their mental health. Identify ways around the specific issues of privacy, stigma, discrimination about mental health issues and dis dis demonstrating the importance of collaboration and appropriate referrals when supporting a health professional seeking care. I would like to acknowledge that you've, many people have also uh, submitted a lot of questions when you registered. So we have over 300 questions that have been submitted. I am confident that a lot of the answers will come from the presentations and the Q&A, but I, as much as possible, will try and cover as much as we can. But I do apologise in advance if your questions don't get specifically answered. It's just impossible in the time frame. And um, you can also type questions into the question manager, and I'll keep an eye on that as well. Once again, there's, um, there's, we'll do our best to cover as much as we can. Just to remind you of the case study, which you've seen a little video, um, it's about a young doctor who visits his GP after experiencing a panic attack um, on the hospital ward round. And uh, so he, he's a young doctor who has um, buried himself in study and he did really well in med school. His mum's a bit of a warrior. He lost his father when he was 11 in a road accident. and. Um, Ever since he started working, he's found himself feeling more and more anxious, especially during ward rounds. For anyone that is a junior doctor or a doctor who went through that, 
um, ward rounds can be quite stressful. I think they're stressful for patients too, but it's another story. Um, he says the feelings are getting worse now and that he's starting to avoid people. He's not suicidal, but everything's an effort and he doesn't want to quit, he just doesn't know what to do and he's come to the doctor to get some help. I would like to point out and to give uh, a thank you to the Doctors' Health Services um, Limited, which is from the Doctors' Health South Australia, um, which is part of a national educational um, program, which can be found on the website Doctors for Doctors. So that will, that's one of the resources um, for any doctors who are watching tonight. There's a, a national website called Doctors for Doctors that links you into all of the local doctors' health services. So we'd like to thank them for allowing us to use that, this video for the case study. And uh, in our case study, our young man has presented first to his general practitioner, and so I'm going to invite Roger, first of all, to respond to this case um, from the perspective of a GP. Thanks so much, Roger. Yeah, thanks, Mary. <coughs> Look, this, uh, I'm not, I found this quite emotional to watch. It's um, This person is somebody's son, a clearly exceptional young man who's struggling with a what's become an incapacitating anxiety disorder. Um, he mentions a number of triggers for this. <clears throat> but to my view, he's clearly at a crossroads in his career. The high risk that he may leave the profession, which would be an absolute tragedy, and uh, this, I think, underpins the importance of our work in treating colleagues. Um, <clears throat> the fact he sought help requires a huge effort. And uh, I think another point we should discuss later on is the effort it takes for health professionals to ask for help for other health professionals. It sometimes takes a long time to pluck up the courage. Um, but as I said, the stakes here are very, very high. But the whole case made me think of a, a number of things that I've seen in, 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 uh, in treating doctors. And firstly, the, the, um, uh, what we bring into our studies as health professionals, and if you look at the first slide, there are things like uh, our, our IQ, our EQ, uh, the things that motivate us, our own life experiences and resilience. Uh, Self-esteem is a great driver for high achievement in, in, in health professionals, uh, various outside interests. Uh, particularly two things, I think prior health problems, not all students entering their undergraduate studies are healthy. They bring in you know, sometimes anxiety, undiagnosed anxiety disorders, mood disorders, under-treated depression, some of autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis, these things are all things that we've seen. And typically they intensify during the transition through our career. So we've all, as health professionals, all go through career transitions from under undergrad to postgrad to various placements. And these are typically associated with considerable increase in anxiety. The next uh, point is, uh, in my travels, I see lots of different per doctors with personality types. And I'm sure there's the same across all the health professions. And there's three that are particularly common that I see, and they're, they're a double-edged sword. The obsessional personality traits are, are common. Uh, they make for very thorough health professionals, um, a lot of you know, detail, drilling down, perfectionism, and... Uh, but, but along, along with that comes a propensity to anxiety, particularly during transitions in our career, particularly during transitions. We then have the avoidant health professional, often who uh, are very, find it hard to refuse to, a request from patients. Uh, so they quickly build up a very large following of patients who know that when they go to see that health professional, it's very unlikely that their request will be refused. <laughs> So these are people who don't like conflict and uh, these doctors and health professionals quickly build up a large following which can become overwhelming and be rewarded sometimes by the use of a sedative or alcohol or substances at night to, to relax. And th the third type we see is the dependent health professionals who really enjoy being amongst people. They like the contact with patients, with people, and uh, you know, often share a bit of their own lives with, uh, with their patients. Uh, and develop quite close relationships with those patients, a, a mutual sharing of things. They're the much-loved health professional, and the risks here is they may get too close to patients and uh, uh, undergo boundary violation. Third thing is, with this case, raises up the barriers. What what barriers uh, are in in the way for health professionals to seek to seek help? And the, the mental health condition itself can be uh, the low energy associated with depression. 
the uh, anxiety symptoms can be a great deterrent to going out and sitting in a waiting room or even picking up the phone to make an appointment. Um, there's a lot of embarrassment around the timing of the presentation. Is this serious enough to ask for help? Will I look foolish if I admit to what I've done or what I've not done to this point? Um, previous negative experiences, a loss of trust in the skill set of the health professional, uh, not unusual, <clears throat> and, and mostly in, in, uh, in medicine particularly is career jeopardy. Admission of or disclosure of any uh, illnesses can be a career jeopardising move. So these are all things I think that come out in the video. The other big fear is mandatory notification, something we can talk about a bit later on. But essentially, uh, I, I was previously chair of the medical board here in South Australia and uh, familiar with the transition over into APRA. Um, you know, at this stage, you need to hold a reasonable belief that in the course of practising their profession, uh, this particular health professional has placed the public at substantial risk of harm from four things. Easy to remember, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and impairment. If you can remember those three. Rock and roll is rock and roll in their behaviour or their performance. But that essentially sums up the sort of indicators for notification. In the case of students, it's a little narrow. It's, it's uh, just impairment. So I think that's important to, to uh, and I know we've had some questions around mandatory notification, but it's always a dilemma. It's very significantly misunderstood. And I think uh, hopefully we can open that up in the discussion later. Uh, the, other, the other barrier is when, when um, uh, health professionals go to another health professional, there's uh, six things that I find interfere with that and make corrupt it. There's the tendency to give and take a selective history. That is, you don't want to reveal everything in case you get a diagnosis that you don't want. There may be an expectation of special treatment being seen after hours or at special times and being given a, a billing, billing discounts. Social content intruding into the consult at the, expect, at the expense of the clinical content. Uh, Self-treatment, coming along to the health professional, having done a whole lot of things that they would have tried and denying them any chance to offer something new and refreshing. And sabotaging the consultation, steering the treating practitioner away from the diagnosis you don't want. And the consulting style, obviously, uh, some people just are never going to get on. So, uh, And finally, I think, just to finish up, there are some practitioners who do extremely well, carry very heavy loads, heavy burden in their personal and professional lives. And there's probably 10, uh, 10 various things which do assist them in getting by, carrying these loads and, and getting through difficult times. Having their own GP, looking after their basic existence needs, food, water, sleep, sunlight, exercise having a network of personal and professional supports, which often come from unexpected sources, having creative interests uh, that we've already spoken about. For me, it's been music and Mary. Good to hear, Mary. We should have a jam online one time. Uh, and fulfilling all their other roles. We're all somebody's son, somebody's daughter. We need to remember those other roles that we have. And from time to time, discussing the burden we carry with a colleague, sitting down, tell me exactly what your working week looks like at the moment. And sometimes the stories I hear are horrible. Um, having planned breaks, recognising the warning signs in ourselves and in our colleagues are critical. How do you react when you're under pressure? Do you withdraw? Do you become irritable, controlling, cranky? How do you do it? And having a crisis plan. So many practitioners I see have never thought about uh, an injury that might take them away from work for six months, what they would do in that situation. So all of these things I hope will come up later in the discussion. For me, for Mary, for me, that case raised, I think, all of those issues and, um, and uh, plenty more. So over to you, Mary. Thanks so much, Roger. Um, and I, I must say, I felt like I personally had all three of those trays of the beginning GP. Fortunately, I had some really good therapy for a while and um, managed to get by. So I would um, really like to welcome Christina now to talk to us about um, how you might respond to this young man from a psychologist's perspective. Thank you. Well, I think from a psychology perspective, it's really, really important to uh, acknowledge what has actually happened. So we've got a lot of um, issues that we need to tease out. Obviously, there's an acute anxiety episode that's happening, although it sounds like it's been happening for some time. 
uh, then we've got the potential uh, background information, some possible um, family mental health history with anxiety in the mother, which may have or may not have contributed to learnt behaviour uh, with anxiety. Then we've got an early um, loss with, with the um, death, so that uh, is also potentially having an impact. Um, and then there's uh, what appears to be the fear of um, failure perhaps, or speaking up in ward rounds or getting it wrong. Um, so they're all issues that we would need to take note of. Um, I guess underlying that, we've got this problem with stigma. So as Roger mentioned, the fear of mandatory reporting um, for any, uh, I guess, disclosure of mental health issues or any difficulties is a significant issue. Um, as the case study said, there was, uh, I guess, quick to um, quick to notice that uh, there's issues there, but uh, they're not at severe risk, so they're not suicidal. Um, and I think it's really, really important that we acknowledge that despite um, trying to break down the stigma, the misconceptions around mandatory notification continue. The uh, worry I see uh, with most people about the uncertainty with the career impact, the fear of negative evaluation from both their peers and their supervisors tends to go uh, throughout their career, unfortunately. Um, there's much misunderstanding about what actually constitutes impairment, what is a substantial risk of harm to public, and I'm sure um, my colleague is going to expand more on that later. Um, the thing that I think is really important when seeing any health professional with uh, issues that present, whether it be the GP, the psychologist or the psychiatrist, is to reinforce for them that mental health does not discriminate. It can happen to anyone. It's not a reflection of their level of resilience, their character or their competence in their profession. Uh, and I often tell uh, my clients, especially the doctors, that medicine is hard. It's inherently stressful. We know this. Given that, it's to me quite understandable that at some point people are going to struggle. Um, we know that uh, medical students start off with uh, better health and on par as their non-medical peers and somewhere as they progress that changes. So there is something about the professions themselves that is stressful. Um, despite knowing that um, mental health issues are prevalent in medicine, uh, psychology, nursing and so forth, um, I have lots of clients who struggle with severe shame. They're, uh, they feel completely defective, as though they're one step away from being found out, so to speak. Their fear of failure is uh, very, very high, uh, which, as Roger said, uh, perpetuates anxiety and often perpetuates the depression. Um, and it's this uh, balance on the logical side, the kind of doctor side of them can uh, provides statistics for me and lets me know that there is a greater risk of mental health and burnout in medicine. Um, but this other part uh, feels that's happening to other people, that's not them, and this perception that everyone else is coping, they go to ward rounds and everyone else seems to have it uh, together and they feel that it's just them. So one of the things I try to do in working with any health professional is help them to understand and recognise that they're a human, first and foremost, who happens to work as a doctor, psychologist, nurse, paramedic, other health professional. And that with treatment, any of these professionals can go on to have fulfilling lives, successful careers, and do well in the job that they're training to do. The other thing is that we want to help <laughs> as people that work in the doctor health field. We want to support people, we want people to reach out, and we hopefully 
are not punitive, so it's a safe environment to do so. Um, so uh, like with anyone, I think this is really important, and Roger touched on it before, that we take a comprehensive history. It doesn't matter what occupation your client has, a comprehensive history is paramount. And that includes a risk assessment uh, for doctors, which is something that can be uh, tricky at times because doctors um, may deny or minimise or attribute difficulties to something else. Uh, they're often very, very scared of telling you they have suicidal ideation, that they're severely depressed, um, but it's still an important thing to cover. Um, I often utilise uh, questionnaires as well as an interview um, because that can be quite telling in and of itself if they're high symptoms, but also they rate very low. So it's um, the discrepancy between they're coming for treatment yet uh, according to their measure, everything's uh, fine, which then informs my treatment plan and our intervention. Uh, we'll touch more on this later, but a collaborative team approach with, of course, authority to uh, exchange information is paramount for everyone involved in the client's case, the GP, the psychiatrist, as is gaining collateral information uh, with, again, the client's permission. I often... Um, get collateral information from spouses, parents, family, friends. Um, again, imperative in working with health professionals that therapy is a safe space. We want to help you. It is confidential. Uh, as Roger said, the, um, it needs to be a substantial risk to the public and many of the mental health conditions I see do not meet that um, threshold at all. So it's imperative that we help our health professionals know that they can and do get better, um, which is often quite difficult for them as they often feel hopeless and worthless and uh, a little bit stuck. As a psychologist, I think the therapeutic relationship is key. In my experience working with doctors, the ability to build trust is really important and it facilitates open disclosure. People can become a bit more uh, sharing and you can get some useful information that initially was um, not given or that they're hesitant for. Again, we want to work within the treating team and often really important um, with doctors is to help them understand that therapy, unlike other aspects of medicine per se, can take a little bit more time than what they're perhaps expecting. Doctors, as Roger said, are very driven, so they often um, come expecting a uh, strategy to fix all their problems. It would be lovely, but it's not so simple, unfortunately. Um, obviously, there are a wide range of treatments, and this differs um, by professional and also tailored to the client. Uh, treatments I utilise in working with uh, health professionals and the doctors and medical students in particular. Uh, I utilise schema therapy, cognitive behaviour therapy, and find EMDR very effective in treating uh, trauma. So that's been useful. Again, we're reiterating that message that with treatment, things can get better. You can have successful careers and life can be good. Um, I mentioned before, collaboration is essential. Um, an important part of that is educating the client in front of you that uh, they can still get help by people that understand their needs. Uh, for example, the doctor's health service is an excellent example of uh, being tailored to meet the needs of GPs and uh, other doctors and medical students. So um, often the uh, doctors I see are uncertain about where to get help. Um, and they tend to be somewhat avoidant of that, so encouraging them and helping them access supports and other experts in that area are really important. Also, um, telepsychology is really important. It's something I've been offering for uh, several years now. Um, it's, it's especially important for um, perhaps doctors in state 
or those that work rurally and remotely in a small community where there are other colleagues with the other treating professionals or they know them and it's not appropriate for them to see them for their own therapy and care. So uh, telepsychology has been a big um, advantage there. So uh, I hope that, that persists. Uh, another thing that is important when working with health professionals is to help them and encourage them to remain engaged with the treating team. Um, some of my clients were really good at uh, initially seeing the GP and perhaps the psychiatrist and over time uh, they have a tendency to let those go or have less regular appointments. So I try and encourage them that you know monitoring needs to happen from all professionals. Uh, collaboratively and like Roger said we want to be quite upfront with discouraging self-prescription, discouraging self-treatment and helping them see that it's okay to struggle and there is help available and we want them to get better. Thanks, Christina. Um, I'm just going to acknowledge a couple of questions in, in that have come in um, through through the chat box. Um, firstly, if you're having problems with your volume, check your own computer volume. And if you um, are still struggling, go to the number or the frequently asked questions. If you can't find the answer, then call the 1-800 number and Redback will talk you through fixing the volume. There's a question also around what um, questionnaires Emma, uh, Christina might use in her initial assessment. So we'll, we'll put that on hold and we'll come back to that in the Q&A. And I'd like to welcome Emma um, to, to let us know how you would think about the, the case. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. And thanks to Christina and Roger for covering everything I wanted to talk about too. So no, I just wanted to say ditto. Oh, there we go. Um, thinking about it, the, my first question is with doctors, with everyone, but in doctors in particular, is to listen to what is not said as well as what is said. Um, everybody's mentioned avoidance and shame and doctors are really good at hiding things. You know, in um, very good at deflecting and in medicine, doctors learn the stiff upper lip in medical school. You're not supposed to complain and if you complain, you are the faulty unit. So if we think about what we know about this man's early life, he said his mother was anxious. And, you know, it's pretty understandable when a husband gets um, killed when her child is 11. But get get a load of what he said. He said, it's okay. And he reassured that doctor so much that, about his dad dying that she didn't ask him anymore, I'm assuming. I'm going to take liberties with this history. Um, so he took control and she didn't ask any more questions about that. Um, you know, so we could talk about the psychodynamics of this particular case, you know, um, he's likely learned not to rock the boat and not to communicate his own feelings in order to protect his mum. And we also might wonder, is this why he entered medicine? And if we're writing a sitcom, we'd have the storyline of repairing the guilt that he felt about the death of his father or something. And that's, it could be, a, anyway, this is a make, made up um, patient, so we can say what we want about him. In thinking about what is not said, one of the first things is, and what was not taken in the history, was a drug and alcohol history. Um, and this is um, pretty significant. Um, doctors have a higher rate of substance abuse than the rest of the population and a significant rate of problematic alcohol abuse. And um, coming to work when intoxicated is a mandatory notification um, so I will talk about APRA a bit later, but um, substance abuse really is a significant problem. Um, and with an avoidant person asking about drug and alcohol, it's something that in my history I would come back to again and again and again because not that I think anybody's lying or anything like that, it's, it is quite a shameful thing and people know that they're not supposed to be doing it. 
they can't feel that they can't help her anyway. So that's the first thing I would really make sure is really make sure you tick off that you have inquired about drug and alcohol use. The next thing is suicide. Um, she didn't really, I mean, he asked about, he told her about suicide. She didn't ask about suicide. He, he, he headed her off at the pass um, yet again. Like, I really think that as the clinician, you need to ask the question. And also, you know, those kind of, that gut feeling, those senses that you think something, trust those two when you're um, thinking about that. It's really important. Like, I feel like if I'm talking to a bunch of mental health professionals about asking about suicide, I think I'll just go over it just to be sure. It's got to be in the right setting. You've got to create the right space in order to ask the question. And the question is suicide. It's not, you know, if you've been feeling so bad, have you thought about self-harm? Because self-harm is actually something different to suicide. And to be direct, um, you are more likely to get a more direct um, answer. And we're trying to model this kind of communication because otherwise it's just dangerous. Um, the other thing, I can't see my slides. Oh, I've forgotten what I, the other point um, You had was. cultural cultural issues. Oh, yes. And then the yeah. APRA concern yeah. you've mentioned. Yeah. So one of the things that was a bit of a deflection was this case study was what of a white man. So I'm going to talk about a few things that we might not notice in seeing this patient but certainly helps a lot, you know, certainly affects a lot of doctors. The issue of sexual harassment, sexual assault and rape occurring in the workplace is significant. Um, and it is also important to know that it just doesn't happen just to women. It also can happen to men. And opening up some part of the... Um, conversation and history which will focus on workplace issues so as well as asking about burnout and things like that is asking about feeling uncomfortable at work and asking about any sexual harassment or sexual traumas at work. Another huge problem that we're not seeing with this, maybe not seeing with this case, is the issue of racism and any doctor who is a person of colour, has an accent, is a recent immigrant, is Indigenous, is going to face racism likely every day in their working lives. And it's a huge problem. And not only is it the bigotry by patients, and you're on your own with those because no one's going to help you, there's also the issues if some patient is being so obnoxious, what do you do? Do you refuse to see them because they're racist? And a colleague of mine who's another um, Indigenous psychiatrist um, in Canada, she had this huge issue. You know, do you, do you just suck it up and push on and see people who are faintly, not faintly, actively abusive to you? Or do you... Do you, become a, do you feel like you're a quitter or do you risk having a complaint made against you by a regulatory board because you've refused to see somebody? There's bigotry by staff and colleagues. And, you know, it may not be those big things, but it's those micro... Well, sometimes it is the big things, actually, let's be honest. Um, and it's often really hard if you are the only person in a group in a workplace. Um, from my personal experience, I'm an Aboriginal woman and I have been, you know, for a while there was only two of us Aboriginal psychiatrists in Australia. And being single, you'd say something and you'd be labelled, oh, she's the angry, she's the angry Aboriginal woman, you know. And I'm sure that everybody in every group who feels like they're isolated has that. And, the, you know, do you fight every fight? You know, do you take everything on or do you suck it up and just let your... Um, oh, my goodness, I've forgotten the word. Cortisol take over. 
Um, you know, these microaggressions are, um, are particularly um, severe. Um, so the next thing is, I think the last thing is about, um, I just wanted to talk about, because I think a lot of people are very, very anxious about this, is about um, mandatory no notifications. There are four reasons that mandatory notifications are made. They are intoxication when practising, a significant departure from um, professional standards, um, sexual misconduct and impairment. And as a treating psychiatrist and a member of a medical board, I've got to say that impairment has to be not just the degree of severity that it would affect safety of patients, but in a situation where the practitioner isn't taking responsibility for it. So you can have a psychosis and just say, okay, I'm not going to be at work until I'm better and signed off by my doctor. And that wouldn't, tr with the current rules, that wouldn't trigger a notification at all. You can be, if you're away at home, you can be as mad as you like. But if you take it to work, then that, that becomes um, the problem. And so it's often those severe illnesses that really lack insight that, that do cause problems. Um, but if you're sad or feeling suicidal, that's not a reason to avoid getting the treatment that you um, would benefit from. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, Emma. I, I just learned a lot from what you just said and I, you know, um, it's just really helpful for us all to remember that these really severe things can happen to health practitioners as well. And the thought of having to, you know, practice every day with racism directed at you in your practice in addition to dealing with everything else is pretty full on. So I really appreciated um, what you had to say. And I'd like to um, welcome us all back into the chat. So there's been a couple of things that have come up from the audience that I think we might start with. Christina, I did give you a little bit of warning. Um, someone has asked, I, I actually can't tell whether the questions are just coming to me or everybody, but somebody asked what is EMDR, so that's Eye Movement Desensitisation and Reprocessing Therapy, it's a particular evidence-based therapy for trauma. Um, there was also a question, what is schema therapy, and that's really looking at underlying core beliefs that people have about themselves, and I recommend that you just look those things up because you can find really good information. Um, but Emma, just as a, sorry, Christina, as a practical um, tip, what kinds of questionnaires might you use in an initial session with someone presenting with kind of anxiety and depression who's a health professional? Thank you for that. Um, I would use, obviously, the same uh, health professionals don't have separate questionnaires for themselves. So we obviously use the standardised questionnaires that we would use for any other presenting client. Um, I also tend to do this once I'm with the client. As I've noticed with uh, doctors in particular, they will minimise and you'll get a questionnaire that just isn't uh, representative nor of much clinical value at all. So I think we need to have the, the um, understanding about misconceptions and how freely they can actually speak before we give them questionnaires. Otherwise, it's, as I said, not, not very representative. Um, uh, questionnaires that I like tend to be the PHQ-9 for depression, the GAD-7 for generalised anxiety. Um, the DAS is okay, but if you see uh, GPs, then they're very typically used to scoring those. So sometimes using something that they don't necessarily use themselves can be useful. And there's a whole range of others. It depends, obviously, what the presenting problem is. Thanks, Christina. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm just collecting my thoughts here. Um, now, Roger, I would like to come to um, a question for you. There was in the registration questions and also in the chat just now, um, a question around um, 
how to assist and uh, just to answer an audience question, we are talking about all health professionals here. A lot of our um, comments are around doctors because they're particularly tricky, but um, all of the information is relevant to all the health professionals that you're treating. Um, Roger, uh, when, how do we go about thinking about like a kind of, when is somebody ready to return to work? So Emma's, Emma's beautifully said that you could be as mad as you like as long as you're at home and not placing patients at risk of harm. How do we make decisions around knowing when people are ready to return to work? Is there any kind of guidance around that? This is a, a, really, a really good question. And I think to understand that, it's good to start with how were they working at the time they were unwell and what's been their work history over the years. It, it's always amazed me how people... Uh, often in, in health professional circles asks, uh, are, are you working full time? This can be a question that pops up in a social setting, but also at other times. And I thought, well, what is full time for health professionals? And I think if you're sitting down with patients all week doing nine or 10 sessions of consulting, that is not full time. That is about 1.5 FTE. Everyone listening knows when you see people, you have to document. You're often maybe doing a case notes at home on the weekends or late into the evenings. So the actual work associated with clinical care really extends well beyond. So what people uh, define as, as, their, as their full time is often very, firstly, very interesting to explore. So you wouldn't want to send somebody back into that again. Um, and, of course, one of the new workplace health and safety hazards of the modern era is the ability to remotely log in from home. It's the worst thing because that extends your working week, your FTE from one up to about 1.5 because it's just so tempting to go in another night and tidy up your case notes or work from home or log in. So we're seeing this an enormous amount with uh, particularly younger obsessional uh, professionals who are very worried about making a mistake and making an error uh, so, so understanding their prior work environment is very important and the triggers that built up to this. For example, you may have an obsessional person who is working in a very, very uncertain environment. It may be a very unpredictable, rapidly changing, rapidly moving clinical environment, which is completely unsuited to their personality type. You may have an avoidant health professional with a very large caseload long, complex consultations, um, very, very demanding patients who, who, who expect you to sort out everything and don't necessarily want to get better, by the way. But it's very unfair to send that patient back into that same working environment um, if you have a dependent health professional who's, again, got a large caseload and their patients will wait weeks or even months for them to come back to work. And when they do, they've got weeks and months of problems that they're going to dump on the health professional and expect them to sit there for an hour when they've got a half-hour appointment, for example. So understanding their prior work environment is very important. And I think uh, setting their expectations that a graded return to work is often the best way. It's it takes a while to negotiate, not only with the employer, but sometimes with the person themselves. If you're self-employed, it's probably a little bit easier, but the boundaries between home and work can sometimes be difficult. So I think there's many factors to consider. Uh, I'm sure all of those people listening who may have had uh, an injury or time away from work, returning work can be very stressful. It's a transition from not working back into work, and with that comes a lot of unanswered emails and uh, clinical notes and letters and requests, it can be hell going back to work. So a graded return is important and uh, creating a, a work environment which uh, they feel safe, they feel valued and they feel listened to are the three key ingredients for a safe workplace, safe, valued and listened to. And I think that's important that we advocate for our patients in that return to work and make sure that the, the workplace is safe the work practices are reasonable, they're not being flogged uh, and their workload and their working week matches their personality type. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, Emma, I'd like to ask you, so we, we've just talk, heard from Roger about returning to work but we didn't really think about how do we know when someone needs to take time off work 
and how how do we go about helping someone make that decision? Is it something that, as a psychiatrist, you might just say, "This is my clinical opinion that you need to stop working now"? What do you do if you're not a psychiatrist? Can you talk around yeah. that a little bit? Um, well, it depends on on what it is, um, what the condition is. Um, I often just talk about the effects of long-term stress that's been allowed to fester, you know, um, and how that can make um, mental health disorders, substance abuse disorders, um, strains in relationships, um, and even medical conditions a lot worse. So, you know, I'd probably, you know, indicate that, you know, there are negative effects from continuing um, at work and also you know provide the positive um, things of if you have a break it's really really helpful um, and you know sometimes if it's just a little bit you know having a few breaks earlier is probably better than falling in a heap and having a longer break necessary break um, later on um, so it's it's also giving permission. It's also, you know, um, and I think we can all play a part in this in perhaps in changing the culture um, that it's okay to have, it's okay to have a break. It's okay to do something in your else in your life for a while. Um, in, in a lot of colleges, um, you know, it's been, maybe not, through the medical boards, it's been acknowledged that if you want to have a break for a while and do some non-clinical work around your area, that's equally um, valid. And I think I'm talking about doctors here, but for, for all health practitioners, doing something else for a while is also useful. Thanks, Emma. Um, Christina, I'm just going to ask you a, a, perhaps a slightly um, tangential question. But um, if, if someone... It comes to see you they might they might come on an, a, mental, a mental health treatment plan that their GP has prepared for them should is there concerns about having a mental health treatment plan item number on your my health record is, is that something a health pr practitioner should worry about whether or not it's something they should worry about is something they do worry about um, I I mean, the mental health care plans, as far as I see them with my clients, the worry is often difficulty getting indemnity insurance, um, which some people uh, refuse to go on a mental health care plan and just offer to pay privately. But I do see um, several, uh, predominantly doctors and medical students, but also psychologists and nurses that come under a mental health care plan um, I'm wondering if Roger might be able to speak a bit more about uh, his experience because he would be the one um, and or ever about um, what they see because they would be the um, referring doctors. Yeah, Roger, would you be able to comment on that concern about a mental health treatment plan? Yes, I, it gets back to this point about a stigma and um, nobody wants to... Uh, had that label uh, in my experience. But there's a, a movement, there's a shift towards a more acceptance of this. But really, in, in, in all, all health professionals, we're brought up to be uh, those who, who manage these problems. We don't suffer from them. Uh, we, and there's a culture there that we're a little bit above it, we're a little bit immune from those things. Our training, to some extent, is self selecting, and uh, our resilience and our ability to manage these things really builds over time through our, our undergraduate years and through our work. And we see so much of it that we, uh, that we feel we can uh, handle it. So it's, uh, it's an important um, thing to acknowledge that there's a, a great reluctance to. But my, my personal experience is those who, who do come and seek for help like that are very keen to have a mental health plan. Um, the issue of confidentiality always comes up and... It's the, it's the whole thing that perhaps has delayed the My Health Records uh, uh, spread across the nation. Is there been concerns about is it confidential? How is that information going to be used? And, and particularly, it's particularly so with life insurance. I think um, uh, it's probably even more of a concern having uh, life insurance 
a record of that often excludes or uh, excludes that as a as a thing that can be insured for. So that certainly is a concern amongst uh, amongst doctors. I know particularly that they their their life insurance eligibility can be jeopardised. And Roger, there is I believe that there is some um, advocacy around that and trying to get that um, thought about and changed if possible. Because there were some questions in the registration about you know once we know about these things, do we have some duty to try and change the system to make it um, you know more health professional friendly for us to get care? So I do I think there is some energy around that. Perhaps Roger, just do you know? About that? Yes, yes, yes. There is. There's, there's a softening of uh, the, the processes of um, uh, uh, complaints, for example, are, uh, are very harsh, and they uh, do have a negative impact on on uh, all health professionals being notified. Um, and it's it's a barrier. You know, if you've got to think, what are, what are the things that stop health professionals seeking independent health care for themselves, rather than managing the problems themselves, and um, you know, doctors are no different to anybody else. If, if you've got the skill and the ability to manage things, you, 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 you tend to do so as far as you can go yourself. You think what our patients do, they might talk to their partner, they might talk to, they get some phone advice, they might go to the pharmacist to get some advice, then they might go to the doctor, then they might go back to, to get a prescription for something. There's many steps in the process to seeking help. And a lot of that can be bypassed as a health professional and you know, it's if you can do that, why wouldn't you? Because um, it's very inconvenient attending for an appointment during the day and having to go and get a prescription that you may be able to write for yourself or have have a, uh, a, a, a some sort of management that you know you can do yourself. So it's it's very tempting for health professionals to treat themselves a little bit too far sometimes, and maybe progress, their illness may progress to the point where you know even they don't realise that it's gone to that extent. So. Um, you know the barriers that uh, exist are really there to be overcome. It's about having a clear pathway of help, having somebody you know and trust who who, who can see you in a timely way, who is confidential, uh, and uh, and I think who can advocate for you in the health system. And these are very important things. I think that make it easier for health professionals to seek independent care for themselves. Thanks. Roger for that and Emma you may want to add um, something to that and I also um, wanted to ask you about um, sometimes people need inpatient care and they might have particular yeah. concerns around um, privacy and confidentiality and also um, when someone's off for an extended period of time the employer might start asking lots of questions. So are you able to, I'm sorry that was a bit of a double question. Yeah, okay. I'll just, I'll just Imagine a patient who's in hospital who's, who'll be there for a while. Um, it, so I was a VMO at a private psychiatry hospital and we had a lot of um, health professionals, um, cared for a lot of health professionals. Um, it is quite tricky in the public system and I think usually what happens is people unfortunately have to go out of area which can provide quite a burden to families. Um, so the, in a psychiatry ward, um, well the one, the private ones I've worked in, um, confidentiality has just been, has been paramount and um, you know that's a, a, a that's a big factor that everybody um, is aware of um, from the top from the top down. So in terms of um, treating people um, in hos in a hospital, um, I think it's important to note that we will have those those um, privacy privacy things in in train and and. What I found is the nursing staff and allied health staff and everybody in the hospital, you know, when it's one of our own, another healthcare provider, we're all very concerned about privacy anyway. So there's a bit, you know, the extra step being taken. Um, it's important when we have a mental health professional who is now a patient, um, you know, thinking about the things that Roger said about making them a special patient, I really try and I know that they've got medical or other training 
but they're a patient. And when you're really, really stressed, you kind of need to have things spelt out the same as anyone else because you, you might not remember that lecture back in third year or something like that. You're here now and you need to be looked after by every, um, everybody, you know, like anybody else. So then imagine this patient has been in the ward for quite a long time and they're getting hassled by work saying, when are you coming? When are you coming back? And why aren't you coming back? And things like that. Um, first, it depends on the setting, but I, you know we've got to remember people's rights here and what rights the workplace have to information about somebody and how far they can go into their personal lives um, and what's actually required. Um, so, you know, as we're working as advocates for our patients' health and getting, getting better. So I will do what I need to do in communicating with, um, you know, with their employer. And it's often better to be preemptive and get a letter in first and, you know, a, something with not too much information rather than the process to drag out and people to get really worried about what's going on. Um, unfortunately, you know, when the letter's signed by me, and, uh, you know, I've got to say who I am. It says psychiatrist. So, you know, game's over. Um, but, you know, we're all, shouldn't we all be about normalising these things? I know it's hard and with insurance it's hard. I got my... Can I just give it a little aside? I got um, my um, work... Getting sick insurance, whatever that is, like life insurance knocked back because they asked for my GP records and on it the GP had written perinatal psychiatrist and whoever the company looked at saw my job title and thought it was my diagnosis and knocked back my insurance. So they will do anything they can and um, I think... Um, there's, there's, two, there's two levels, I suppose, of discrimination. But work, workplace, if you kind of cooperate with them, unless they're really, really difficult, um, you know, HR often want to, to... No, they don't. I don't know. You have to play it case by case, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Look, I, I'm sorry, it was a bit of a tricky question. Yeah. But, um, I do... Yeah. You know, um, it's something that people people are understandably concerned about. And my observation, I mean, working in a, a facility that has a pro it's private, and we have many health professionals as inpatients. And something that often happens is that they just are absorbed absorbed into the patient group, which is all kinds of people, and that's actually a great relief for them. And they actually find that they have a lot of stuff in common with these people, so they feel more actually a part of things than separate in my observation. Um, Christina, a question's been coming in and was also in, in, in the registration questions around um, treating the children of health professionals. So it's a little bit tangential, but um, it's also relevant and I'm sure it's something that, that you've thought about. Um, are there any particular sort of um, issues or things we need to think about in that situation? Thanks for that. Well, I actually uh, just provide adult psychology, so I don't see uh, younger people. However, um, having experience and listening to the stories of uh, health professionals themselves, the themes of uh, perfectionism, fear of failure, uh, a big need to please, uh, fear of getting it wrong, I mean, these are uh, I guess traits that can be seen from very early in kind of very scholastic um, children. So although they might not be a problem, um, they can escalate. So it's probably a good idea to keep a beady eye on them. And also um, uh, I always spend a fair amount of time looking at their early life experiences. Did they feel connected? How do they see themselves? and so on. So they're important things. But um, just as uh, there are services to help adults, 
there are many to help uh, children. So I encourage everyone that needs help to reach out and, and make that step. Yeah, and I guess what I mean, I, I would have myself treated quite a few health professionals' children and, and one of the big things is just making it clear about communication and confidentiality and boundaries so the young person feels comfortable to speak with you as, as their practitioner and to be clear about what you're going to share with their health professional parent. Um, Roger, there's been um, a question again a number of times. So we talked about helping health professionals' children. Health professionals are also often concerned about their co-workers. So when we see someone who's struggling or we think they, they might really benefit from support, we're worried about them, but they say everything's fine. Do you have any, um, any advice for us for how we look after each other? Yes, great question. Look, uh, Mary, can I just make a point about treating children? Uh, it's, it's very common for um, a number of health professionals' children to never actually have had a consultation, say, with a, a doctor. Uh, certainly doctors' children, uh, the supplies, they've actually never gone to the doctor and don't know how to do it. You know, they may have been treated at home for a whole range of things. So that's just one other thing to, to overcome. And, and, so in terms of colleagues, yeah, this is, this is a really, I'm sure, I'm sure everybody listening probably knows somebody they ha are working with or have worked with who is probably troubled by something. But as we know, health professionals uh, can be very good actors. If you put a, a, a DAS 21 in front of a health professional and say, I'm just going to, I just want you to fill out this form, they know exactly the right answers to write that will steer you off the diagnosis they don't want. So they're, they're, you've got to be really quite inquisitive and persistent. Um, but I, my experience is health professionals do give out little clues. They, they desperately want help, but they're wanting to treat this themselves, often privately, avoiding disclosure, being away from the gazing eye of a potential notifier, and they, they are very reluctant to admit something's wrong. They're trying to meet the expectations of themselves, of their families, of the, the colleagues around them, of patients. And they feel that someone else, by just working harder, working longer, working more persistently, they will overcome it in, in their own time and in their own way. So the, the clues coming out are often very subtle. And uh, one, one, I think, area of uh, behaviour that is important to watch for, uh, this is before we we'll talk about what to do, is uh, health professionals who take risks, risk-taking behaviour is particularly uh, uh, an indicator of, of depression. And um, it's, it's a recklessness around a whole range of things, such as their appearance, arriving at work a little dishevelled, obviously having alcohol on their breath, uh, taking risks with their notation, uh, taking risks, in the case of doctors, with prescribing, uh, taking risks with billing, uh, taking risks with their social media profile. A lot of health professionals aren't aware that APRA can access your social media profile and look at it uh, and say, Your Honour, this is, uh, let me show an example of the sort of health professional that we're talking about. This goes to the character of the person in front of you in the, in, in the dock. So uh, risk taking can come in subtle forms, and it's very important that we all look out for subtle changes in behaviour in our colleagues because a small change in behaviour can be often the only sign. They won't give out many clues and they'll be reluctant when approached. They'll be embarrassed and they'll be wondering, you know, is this going to be the end of my career? They often have a catastrophic view about being discovered. So it's very important to be gentle, to be inquisitive, to be persistent, to be caring and to uh, choose your moment, uh, to call a meeting and have a three or four colleagues with you can be particularly confronting and a quiet one-to-one -one approach can be best but you may need the help of a colleague, a more senior colleague to assist you with it and it's always couched in the fact that look this we're here to help and we've all gone through periods like this you seem to be really troubled what you know what can we do to help and it may be a single issue, a, a difficult patient maybe a colleague to colleague issue, maybe domestic or home issue, a private issue. Um, but once you've identified that they're seeking help, you then need to be able to send them somewhere. It's probably not the best idea to treat them yourself. I think you should preserve your role as a caring colleague and an advocate for them. 
but having a clear pathway of care for that person. Uh, do they have their own GP? Always a great start because they can connect with the wider health system. Is there an EAP associated with the workplace? Uh, is there a, an independent colleague who may be able to come in and, and, and assess? But very often you're dealing with people who are right on the end of um, a, a long, a difficult period. They're, they're hanging on by the fingernails uh, and there's a fine line between you not doing something and uh, watching them go down. And it may be they patients will notice and they'll have a complaint, which is often the, the common thing to see a, an unwell health professional coming before their board uh, uh, with a, um, a health condition which has triggered a complaint and they're going down this disciplinary pathway, which is so sad. So be, be on the lookout, be watchful, be inquisitive, caring, but persistent. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, really helpful. So we actually have whipped through our time, we're nearly there, so I'm just going to give you 30 seconds each to give us your final um, closing message that you'd like people to, um, to go away thinking about. And Emma, people have really appreciated you know, your honesty and your um, being, just reflecting on your practice as you're speaking, so thank you so much for that. And I just wondered if there's anything um, that you would like to, to sort of leave us all with as we close. Yeah, um, we are health providers and health practitioners and when we're seeing a health practitioner we're seeing our brother and, or sister and that can be very confronting, it like, can be like a mirror held in front of ourselves. So when I was a junior doctor running to an arrest, the first thing we would say is check your own pulse first and I think it's really important that we look to see where we're standing, where how we're doing and what our stance is with regards to our patients and, um, and be mindful of our own, um, you know, that we're treating somebody very close to us. Thank you. Uh, Christina, I wondered if you'd like to say anything to finish up. Thank you, yes I would. Um, I think it's important that people know uh, your mental health is important, confidential help is available, we want to help you, we've helped others, they've gone on to overcome the issues and had you know, enjoyable lives, successful careers, a lot of those fears uh, are um, unfounded. Uh, so please don't suffer alone and also please don't wait till it's uh, too bad. Um, in medicine in particular there always seems to be something more important because it's not quite that bad yet. Um, if we can get people coming in when they're stressed, overwhelmed, that's uh, really useful, especially for people that have had uh, years perhaps of uh, fluctuating anxiety or depression or feel hopeless or worthless or uh, feel a fear failure. I guess uh, the uh, most pertinent thing that I see uh, in working with health professionals but in particular doctors uh, is that many of them say if only they had sought help sooner. So there are lots of barriers to seeking help but the relief that comes when we actually make progress and they get better is lovely and makes the job thoroughly enjoyable. Yeah. Thank you, that's really helpful to be able to say to people, many people reflect they wish they'd help, uh, sought help sooner. And Roger, I just wondered if you have a very brief word that you'd like to say to finish. Yes, uh, I think our own health is a professional obligation. It, it just has to happen. If um, It's easier, we're, we're like sponges, we can absorb a lot of stress over many years and not show, but eventually we start to drip. So there's a certain amount we can absorb, but eventually it shows to ourselves and to others. Um, having a break, having a gap year, this came up a little bit in the discussion. What a great idea. You know, uh, we, we don't have enough breaks in our work. We don't plan to uh, get out of the consulting room and out of professional life for a little while to be creative. We're all working in very constrained professions, very constrained by evidence and the regulator. We need to get out and be creative, a very important antidote. Um, and the third thing I'd say is you, you may be in the wrong job. 
if your work is stressful, you may be in the wrong job. <laughs> so it's good to think about that. Am I in the wrong job and where do I do my best work? Is it one-to-one -one with patients or is it really as a teacher, as a researcher, as an administrator? Uh, is my role at a state level or national level or even internationally? Where do I do my best work? Good to think about that because uh, you know a lot of stressed health professionals are actually in the wrong job. Thanks, Roger. That's really helpful to finish with. And look, it's just been a pleasure talking to all three of you and I know that the audience has got so much out of it tonight. So I'd like to thank you all very much. Um, just to remind the audience that you, uh, we would really appreciate you completing the exit survey before you log out um, and it'll appear on your screen after the session closes or you can see it up there now. You will receive a, a statement of attendance um, from MHPN within four weeks and um, each uh, participant will also be sent a link to the online resources within a couple of weeks. I just bring your attention to the um, upcoming webinars that MHPN will be hosting. Uh, the next one is a, a partnership with Emerging Minds looking at introducing child and family practice to parents. That's on the 22nd of September and uh, working collaboratively, collaboratively to address the mental health of people experiencing chronic pain on the 20th of October. Um, Lifeline is always there for us um, and there's lots of uh, resources for health professionals. I would like to mention the Black Dog The Essential Network app which has only recently been um, launched and has links to lots of other things. Um, and also there are um, many local networks that you can join um, and you might like to continue this discussion um, perhaps on a local level or joining a local network or you might like to look at the MHPN podcast which is a new activity that's just starting and you can see the link for that. Um, with regard to the local networks, just keeping in mind, I'll just pop it over to here, that um, many of them are on Zoom at the moment due to COVID. Um, and before I go, I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who've lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Um, and I would like to thank everybody for your participation this evening, including all of our attendees um, who've been very lively in the chat box and I hope you've got a lot out of it. So thanks all and good night.